Hi, this is acting teacher Michael Bean, and this is your free acting for film and TV lesson for Monday, March the 28th, 2022. Today, we are going to be talking in detail about story. So before I get into the lesson, these I've been using these five questions to break down story, and this is something that's really evolved over the last two years of teaching these lessons, kind of a little piece at a time, these questions have been evolving. And right now, I've got it down to some really simple five partly because you got five fingers and it makes it easy to remember. You got, uh, what's the story? What's the style? What are the relationships? What are the changes? And then what does your character want? So story, style, relationships, changes, want. And it's one of those things where if you learned your lines and you're doing your prep and you've got five minutes before you're taping and, just, and you suddenly have this like, oh, I wonder if I, I answered all of my key questions for this. It's something that you can do in five minutes. It doesn't have to be extensive uh, and doing it in practice and getting the practice in your body is something that's really going to support you in doing that skilled work over time. Uh, because, you know, the first time that you go through it in detail, not only will it take more time, but you also will be feeling into which part of this am I getting the most mileage out of. Yeah, and uh, just for fun, oh, let me show you a quick something. If you were like, hey, uh, I love these free acting classes, where could I go to get more of those? Well, you are in luck. All you have to do is go to myfreeactingclass.com. Hey, and you would get this pop-up right here that uh, says, you know, join our mailing list. And then I would periodically send you an email with videos from previous lessons and ideas for upcoming lessons and things from the archives that I think are interesting and worth watching. If you clicked here on the video archive, uh, you would uh, get this page that has a whole bunch of the lessons from the last couple of years. Uh, and then if you want the more recent lessons, because I haven't updated this in a few months, you would click right here and go to the Mike Bean YouTube channel. Uh, now, uh, here, if you were like, man, I wonder if there are more lessons about story, all you have to do is enter that right here. And look at this. Look at all these great lessons about story. Don't tell boring stories. Find behavior that tells the story. Find the changes. Story, 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 story. So many different story things including some very extravagant Michael Bean faces. Um, but this is what happens when you record yourself and put yourself on the internet. So I don't have a whole lot of control over the strange faces that I make, uh, including this one from April of uh, last year, which I pulled up. I was like, oh, maybe I'll use a clip from somebody talking about story. I'm like, hey, there's this guy with no beard from April of 2020. And so uh, just to go over each of them uh, really quickly, you know, with what is the story, I'm looking for basically a one sentence description of the story. You know, one sentence uh, of the scene, one sentence of the whole story. Often you can find that it'll be in the breakdown. So your agent, when you have an audition, will send you a breakdown that will say storyline. Boom, there it is, there's the whole project. And so all you have to do in terms of deciding, so you have to decide what the story for that single scene is. You know, and you wanna make it as simple as possible but it, um, the choice that you make there influences the rest of your choices. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, talking about story a little bit, and in fact, uh, let me see if I can pull up a, a recent breakdown for you, um, just to, to show you what that looks like in terms of getting the breakdown from a, a script. There it is, ah, excellent. I meant to queue this up for you beforehand, and I've got to sort of quickly block out some of the uh, personal detail on here, but that won't be too, too difficult. Okay, is there anything in here that I can't show you? No, I think we're good. Uh, and so this is a, a breakdown uh, from an audition that I went out for uh, just last week. And just to give you a little bit of context. And so if you're doing a scene from class, you have to do a certain extra level of, I'm gonna decide what the story is. And in fact, I'm gonna decide what the story for the whole project is. If you've got a, a professional audition, then you're get, going to get uh, what's called a breakdown. You know, uh, if you're getting through the website A Actors Access, which is one of the two places uh, that actors in Vancouver, BC typically get their breakdowns is from uh, the website Casting Workbook or from actorsaccess.com, which is a division of breakdown services, uh, which is used in Los Angeles. Then you would get, you know, uh, here it is, the name of the character, breakdown title, 
the, um, et cetera, et cetera, details, producers, director, casting director, then you get a storyline. In this satirical time traveling tale, 16 year old Jamie travels back in time to change the fate of her mother's murder that occurs in 2022. When she has a run in with a suspected killer in 2022, she's transported to her mother's high school years in 1987 by her best friend's time machine in order to stop the killer and reconcile her mom. You would also get a role description. Uh, he, him, 50s, open ethnicity, part of the high school science teacher is completely over his job. It's a brief moment of silence for the dead student and then tells kids to take out their beakers while he reads the newspaper. Uh, and so the, uh, you're going to have the storyline, you're going to have the breakdown. And they've usually spent a bunch of time with that. And usually the storyline they will have lifted right from the log line that the writer used to pitch the show to producers. So somebody will have spent a long time kind of distilling it down often into this real simple one or two sentences. So if you've got a professional edition, you don't necessarily have to do that. Now you don't always get a detailed breakdown of the story. And I think it's a useful exercise for yourself anyway. You know, so if I'm quickly going over the story sheet. You know, here's my five key questions, right, which is story. You know, and we're going to go through all these details one at a time. Style, relationships, changes, and want. You know, often called objective. You know, what does a character want? All right. So for uh, let's let's start with the script, and we'll sort of quickly read it. Duke, how do you feel about reading today? Great. You know, so Duke's going to be Christina's mom, and uh, we'll get uh, Christina to be the kid in the scene. Uh, this is from a, an independent film called Ellipse uh, that shot and the cast and shot in Vancouver, BC. And actually, this was one of my students who uh, booked this role, which is one of the reasons that I've got this one in my archive from way back. So, all right, side one, roll L. Now, if this was lifted from uh, the shooting draft of a professional project, then it likely would look different. You know, now this has sort of been copied directly from a script program. And, uh, and often you're going to see that with independent films or student films because they're the ones posting the audition. If it's casting posting in the audition, usually they'll get the whole script. They'll pull pages and scribble on them and put them out. So a lot of the script you've seen in class, you, you can tell just at a glance, oh, this is something that casting is lifted from the shooting draft of the script. And it, something as simple as if this was from the shooting draft of the script, then right beside this int hospice, there would be a, a number that's the scene number. And in the top right corner, we would also have a page number. Now, the fact that they haven't included those means that this has been lifted specifically for this audition uh, by the folks who put this together. So uh, I'll read the stage direction and uh, Christina, you will read L and uh, Duke will have you read Heather. So into hospice room day, Heather enters. A big smile spreads across L's face. It's me. Yeah, I've been dying to see it. That's not funny. It's a little funny. <laughs> How was your day? Phenomenal. Yours? That was good. That's your lying face. Heather chuckles and hands Elle the partially peeled banana. Elle's demeanor changes. She takes a very small bite and holds it pensively in front of her, chewing very slowly. What's wrong? Nothing. Now, one of the exercises that I think is the most useful for understanding story, and if you were only gonna do one exercise and kind of skip all the questions, then you would do this, which is read everything on the page out loud twice, including the stage directions. This time I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight some of the things in the script and in the stage direction that we're gonna to wanna to look at in more detail as we break down the story, because it's fairly simple on the page, but you'll see there's a lot of detail to be mined here. So if you wouldn't mind, let's read it again. Interior hospice room day. Now we're gonna to wanna to look up later what a hospice is in case we don't know. Heather enters. A big smile spreads across Elle's face. Miss me? Yeah, I've been dying to see you. That's not funny. It's a little funny. Now let's pause there, right? So we know that Elle, uh, with Elle has a big smile uh, when Heather walks in. That gives us some clues about you know, how uh, Elle is feeling and about the relationship between them. Um, we have uh, Heather saying that's not funny. And you know, we're going to want to look at why is that not funny you know, to Heather you know, so that we understand this banter a little bit. And let's pick it up again here, Duke. How was your day? Phenomenal. Yours? It was good. That's your lying face. Great. You know, so uh, we've got both of them giving us information. And so something that 
in a longer scene often gets missed is that actors don't in detail read what the other character says. And often what the other character says gives important information about what your character is feeling. So if you're playing Heather and you don't pay attention to that's your lying face, then you don't necessarily know to bring in the detail of Heather's experience that's gonna make a line like it was good make sense. This is something I've talked about in lessons before, psychological realism where in film and TV, especially once you go into drama, and this is definitely a dr uh, dramatic project, uh, the, right, it's got a little element of comedy, they're bantering, but it, the project itself, you know, is, uh, I would say falls under drama, especially when you're in drama, but in film and TV more generally, the idea is that the audience is paying attention so that they can figure out how the character is feeling. So you've got a line like it was good that on the surface is just kind of, you know, super crystal clear. And uh, the expectation is the I'm just going to watch what is that person's face doing when they say it was good? What is their body language doing when they say it was good? What is their tone of voice telling us about it was good? And then what does the other character say back? And all of that is going to give us information about how's Heather actually feeling? What's actually going on there? So little teeny piece of a scene, but there is information there. Heather chuckles, right? So L, you know, sort of pokes her about lying, you know, and this laugh you know, means uh, to me, uh, gives us information about how there's feeling about it. So it's not like my lying face, Arr! right? So she's laughing. This tells us about the relationship. It, it also, uh, to me, reads as, you know, there's probably some accuracy to the tease. Uh, and hands Elle the partially peeled banana. Elle's demeanor changes. We're gonna wanna look up that word demeanor uh, in case we don't understand it. She takes a very small bite. Uh, and holds it pensively, another word we're going to want to look up, chewing very slowly. What's wrong? Nothing. Right, so on the surface, this is a scene about a banana, right? So you know, a, a mom and a daughter who banter with each other a little bit, and there's a banana that some for some reason makes her feel sad. Uh, and so there's a couple of key words uh, that, like I said, highlighted, you know, we're going to uh, quickly look up. Yeah, and everybody watching is probably like, yeah, yeah, Michael Bean, we get it. Like, we know what these words are, but like, just bear with me so I can, you know, quickly show you the resources you would use. And for, in case there's somebody who's like 10 who's watching this, who's like, but I don't know. And normally I would just fake it and pretend. Don't fake it and pretend. Like, it's just so ridiculously easy. Like you're on a computer right now, whether you're with us in person or you're watching this at home. So you clearly have access of some kind, five seconds to look up these words. And especially this first word hospice uh, that is in the breakdown, very important to look up because it gives you context for the entire scene. So if you were to go to, uh, if you were to go to Google and just write, what does hospice mean? You get hospice, a home providing care for the sick or terminally ill, uh, right? So hospice workers. And you could even get uh, Google to pronounce it. Hospice. Okay, if you didn't know how to say it, you had to say that as a line. You know, none of the words that we need to look up you know, are uh, things that... Um, another, uh, another resource is Google Translate, translate.google.com. free, you can get it from anywhere. And again, you can get the pronounced things. Hospice. Right, so I've got a couple of different ways. And this, again, only takes five, 10 seconds. Uh, like anything on the internet, anything you get multiple times or, or from multiple sources, I think is more trustworthy. You know, so two really easy places to find that. We've got two different pronunciations there. Most of these uh, dictionary sites we will also uh, use pronunciation. And then the other words there were demeanor. Uh, demeanor, outward behavior or bearing. Uh, yeah, quiet, somber demeanor. Okay, manner, air, attitude, da, 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 we get the idea. Um, we probably don't need to know what it's you know, from the Latin that it is from, you know, but if you want to geek out about that on your own time, go for it. Uh, and then pensively. Uh, okay, it looks like we're going to pensive lease. We're just going to take off the, what is that, adverb, the L-Y, and, and look up pensive, engaged in, involving, or reflecting deep or serious thought, a pensive mood. So uh, if we were going to go back to, <laughs> uh, but if we we're going uh, to go back to the script here, um, you would see that right from the beginning into, uh, into hospice room day, Heather enters, you know, uh, 
L, big smile, spread across L face. So right away, this tells us L's already there in the room. Heather comes in, you know, and so this, yeah, I've been dying to see you, given that one of the definitions we saw is a term, care for the terminally ill, which again, you could look up if you didn't know what it meant, but it means like somebody who's dying. Uh, if the L's joke, yeah, I've been dying to see you, it's because she's there for end of life care. You know, so uh, if she's there and dying and her mom comes in, she says, I've been dying to see you. And the mom's like, whoa, yeah, like a little too close to, uh, to real and I was like come on if, like I deserve points for being clever uh hey, how's your day phenomenal uh right there's so there's a little bit of sarcastic back and forth yeah like here I am in the dying place it's pretty amazing you know they're uh, they're both sort of jollying each other along pretty good Heather chuckles hands out the partially peeled banana okay so um we don't have any mention of food before that but you know, presumably there's some kind of uh, interaction, you know, before this, you know, or like, you know, whether Heather always brings Elle a snack, you know, is, uh, I don't think super relevant or up to you, uh, but we've got that here. Elle's demeanor changes, right? So the way her behavior, her outward appearance, she takes a very small bite and holds it pensively in front of her, right? So, you know, like a serious thought, chewing very slowly. Heather says, what's wrong? You know, and Elle clearly doesn't want to talk about it. Now, again, the script is noteworthy just for the clarity of it, that this nothing clearly does not mean nothing, right? The words say nothing. If you are the actor, your job is to see this demeanor, pensive, change. Okay, there's something going on here and it's significant. Uh, same thing with uh, Heather's, it was good. You know, maybe not the same level of uh, depth or significance to it, you know, but your job is to bring something to that. So if you are uh, then approaching the script, one of the places that people often start is they start with like, how's my character feeling? I think this is a completely legitimate way to start understanding a script. And um, if, particularly if you're sort of tracking uh, the, the way those feelings change over the course of the script, um, something that Dia, who's joining us today, uh, asked uh, for is like a, a, another little piece of the mood meter, you know, talking about feelings. So my jam, talk about feelings all day, uh, right? If I get in a conversation with somebody who's like feelings, blah, uh, we, like we're just not going to have that much to talk about. So I've been very engaged uh, with something, the work of a guy named Dr. Mark Brackett at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, who came up with this bad boy right here. It's called a mood meter. Uh, mood meter uh, is uh, this really simple color scale from high energy at the top to low energy at the bottom, high pleasantness at the right to low pleasantness at the left. Uh, and so it's just a way of saying like, okay, kind of dom what's the dominant mood of the scene? You know, what's the dominant mood of my character? Or, or uh, for me, a, the person in this moment, I use this as a check-in for all my classes. Like, what's your color? Uh, you know, what's the, the dominant mood for you right now? And it's like, well, I'm like a little, like right now, my bean, I'm actually like probably a little bit above near midline energy. And I, I make people pick one because it, it's important to help get um, specific. And if you can practice by getting specific about your own feelings, then likely that will translate to extra specificity in understanding your character's feelings. So it's like, okay, I'm slightly above baseline, you know, and uh, right now, because I'm teaching and I love teaching and I'm uh, talking about something that very much interests me, I am also like slightly above midline on pleasantness. So I'm high energy pleasant somewhere in here. You know, I'm not way up here freaking out, uh, or I'd be talking a lot faster. Some of you who have seen those lessons where I'm that level of excited, but uh, I'm down here in yellow. So, okay, great, I'm yellow. Now, something that uh, I really like to add to that and that I say in classes, and I just think deserves saying over and over and over again, is that on paper, a writer has to pick a specific or limited set of feelings in order for an audience reading it to understand. They have to say, Duke is happy today. You know, uh, Duke, or next to like Duke was happy and hungry, you know, but they're not gonna say Duke was happy and sad and confused and hungry and you know, the like and baffled and sleepy because at, at some point the audience reading is just going to be like, I, I don't get it. Like this Duke guy, he's full of so many conflicting feelings. He doesn't make sense to me at all. Now, if you actually pay attention to yourself in any given moment, 
probably you've got like one or two kind of top note feelings. And if you're really paying attention and you kind of get in there, there's a lot of time there's like six or seven different things. So like I'm in yellow, right? But right now, maybe I got a little bit of anxiety, you know, which is you know, sort of over in the red, right? Because there's something in the future. Like I'm just talking about actual Michael Bean right now. I can kind of feel it in my body. There's that like a little bit of tightness there in my solar plexus. Oh, okay, okay. So there's like a little bit of anxiety going on there. And I also... Um, like uh, my uh, my body's pretty relaxed, right? So I got some of that like some of those green feels too, like you know, relaxed, calm, tranquil, something in that category. You know, and those are opposites, right? Like I, so I have some relaxed in my body, I have some anxious in my body, but mostly, you know, I'm in this like you know optimistic, hopeful. That's that is a normal human experience. But if you try to write it, people are going to be baffled and confused by you. Uh, and so this is where actors get to do something that writers can't, which is bring in complexity and uh, conflicting feelings, etc. So as you are going through character, just remember to make them as human as you are. You know, and again, this is where noticing specificity in yourself, I think, extends to make the kind of choices you want to make for your character. You don't want to make a, like sort of way out here, reading from a, a way, way distance choices for your character. You want to make like a right up close. Um, my character is as real a person as me, you know, and they feel like their needs are the most important needs because that's what exists in their body right now, and their feels are the most important feels. And the something that an acting teacher said to me uh, years ago that really stuck with me that I really loved was your character's joy is the most important joy, your character's fear is the most important fear, yeah, and it's our job as actors to bring the humanity of that to a scene. Right. Whether you're doing a scene that where, that where you agree with the feelings, where you're like, oh yeah, this scene where this character's daughter is dying, you know, uh, her like um, sadness and her joy and her you know desire to make her daughter feel better is the most important. Yeah, because like I just imagine myself in that situation is the most important. Or whether you're doing a Hallmark movie where like getting the right shoes for Christmas is like the most important thing for the character. You know, and you read it and you're like, oh my God, shoes for Chris Christmas shoes, really? You know, and so that's where you just have to do the work of like, look, you don't have to agree with this. You just have to empathize with the feelings behind it. And remember the character's feelings are the most important feelings. Their character's joy is the most important joy. And because you're a human and you're in a body, you know what that feels like. You don't have to have that experience. You just have to have the feelings behind it. Go like, oh, okay, right, I can bring that. Uh, and so this is the, the tool that I'm using in terms of the, that mood meter um, you know, where I've just taken you know, about 115 different feeling words and I've kind of loosely grouped them and I've put them in categories. Now, this is just like a personal project of my own. This is not peer reviewed science in any way. This, like the last one was science from a guy named Dr. Mark Brackett. This one's a, like a straight up Michael Bean, like mishmash hack job. Uh, you know, but it, it helps me to have, I've actually printed several of these and just like pasted them around my house because when I'm noticing my own feelings, uh, I don't want to always say, yeah, yeah, I'm tired. I'm just tired. I'm tired. I, I want to be able to, to train myself to notice the difference between exhausted and sleepy, you know, and fatigued, you know, and restful and tranquil and you know, content. And you know, the exact words themselves are not that important, right? Again, if you were just to Google Mark Brackett mood meter, you would find their version that has a hundred different feelings in it. I didn't like the way some of them were grouped. And I was like, mm, for me, that belongs over here. So I moved it because I can, because I'm an artist. Uh, I, I empower you to do creative things for yourselves as well. Uh, let's, I've spent enough time talking. It's probably useful to very quickly look at the script again, right? So that uh, missed me, dying to see you, not funny, little funny, how's your day, phenomenal, yours was good, that's your lying face, what's wrong with Okay, good, so we've glanced at it, you don't have to have it in memory, because there it was, there's the banana, the demeanor, pensive, you know, and uh, then if we're going to go to that uh, series of story questions, oops, uh, the, what I meant to do was open this, this one right here, right, so, story. Uh, we're going to start with who, what, when, where, why, how. Now, I will say that when I am working on a script, 
I typically don't write these out. You know, I think that written word is particularly useful where there are bits where you find yourself like overlooking you know, or um, not including some of the things you know. I think in those spots, it can be useful as an exercise to write this kind of stuff out. But if you get through a script and you watch the tape later and you're like, oh, I, I didn't include where I was at all. Right, I have to remember to look at some of that because I did make choices about that, or I did have an impulse when I read the script. It just didn't make it into the performance. So that's where it's just useful sometimes to like take scribbled point form notes, you know, and uh, and include them. Just remembering that at one point I left my own notes for a script here so that I could show them to you, and it looks like it. well, I will remember that for another day. Uh, so who, what, when, where, why, how, right? So we know uh, we've got Elle and Heather. Uh, they write this gets down to the relationship, but I would guess based on this that Elle, uh, that Heather is the mom as long as, but it doesn't say that in the script. So as long as you're choosing like a deeply important, close emotional relationship, I don't think it matters. Uh, right, the, the, if you had the, we're auditioning this for this for real, you'd have the storyline, the breakdown, it would tell you what the relationship is. If you're doing it for class, as long as you make it significant, right, as long as you make it important, I don't think it matters exactly what choice you make. Uh, when, we're assuming this is now, you know, because we don't have any information in the script that would indicate, you know, that they are, you know, in the future, you know, surrounded by high-tech machinery, you know, or in the past, nobody references their pager, or their, you know, I don't know, fax machine or tell, getting a telegram by pony or anything like that. Uh, where they're in a hospice, you know, so they're in a medical facility that's specifically for people who are like very, very, very sick. Uh, you know, why is just included because that's part of those five W's. Uh, you know, how uh, the, um, the next question on here you know, is descriptive words for the characters. Words for the characters. Uh, and so uh, anybody who's uh, in uh, here with us today, if you're playing, uh, if you're playing Heather, right? So if you're playing the mom in this scene, uh, can you give me some descriptive words? Yeah. And so try and keep it to like the kinds of words that you would use to describe, uh, to describe somebody you know, you know, and ideally the words that Heather uses to describe herself. I think this is a really useful exercise, just you know, five real simple kind of words or adjectives all in plain language. And it's not about a particular way of speaking or a particular you know, way of phrasing it. You know, uh, throw some ideas in the chat window for me. You know, how do you think Heather describes herself? Right, and we remember that like the, the banter about her lying face, you know, with the, right, she's caring. I, I think that that's supported by the script. It's a, a great choice. So let's say you know, we uh, lead with caring. What else? Worried. She's caring. They're caring. She's worried. She's brave. You know, and um, the right. We could use any synonym you know, for worried in there. You know, the uh, we could include. We could make a, a, a choice you know, for. Heather that justifies her like basically like why did what was wrong with her day why does her day suck well you could just look at it on the surface and say well her daughter's dying like does she really need to know the reason Michael Bean like is a parking ticket really like a relevant choice or no probably not but, like her daughter's dying so like she's like yeah you know my day is good here at the hospice visiting you and bringing you a banana you know like that's probably plenty of reason for her lying face you know, we could, if it was meaningful to you, and if you like geeking out about that stuff, well, God, like get in there and be like, okay, yeah, she's overwhelmed. Uh, her daughter being in the hospital is, you know, causing all this extra stress on her relationship. So it's like, I'm worried, I'm overwhelmed. You know, like I had a fight with my husband before coming here. I, you know, the those kinds of things are only useful in as much as they charge you up personally. Otherwise, it's just a really interesting academic exercise between you and your journal. You know, but what we're looking for is something that makes you feel. And that's why it is worth doing this in practice and in a class where you can take a little more time with it. So you can just really investigate which ones of these questions make me feel the most. And what kind of things can I feed myself imaginatively that are going to trigger my, me in feeling and inform the script? Uh, and you can, we could do the same exercise uh, easily for L, you know, or any of the other characters. It can be useful if, like, if you're playing L and you have a really good sense of L is, you know, and you do the scene, you're like, ah, oh, you know what? 
I'm just kind of talking kind of generically to the mom. She's a sort of generic mom as opposed to like a specific person. You're, sometimes it can be helpful if you're playing L to do this exercise for Heather. Be like, oh yeah, she's quirky. You know, and the way you talk to your quirky mom, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I know who quirky is. Maybe my mom, like my mom, eh, not so quirky. You know, but mm, I know, I, but I can ground that in something that's real. Because like me, Mike Bean, I know what it's like to talk to somebody who's quirky. I'm like, okay, they're going to be my friend, Wiley. And I'm just going to like talk to this person the way that I talk to Wiley, but also bring in the like the care from the mom side of things. And like I'm kind of mashing up my feels, you know, in a way that, inspires me creatively. And I'm not thinking about it too much. Like I'm not going like, I will write the 4% of this and 5% of that. I put the feelings in the beaker and I mix it and titrate. Like I'm really just going like, I don't know, they'll try this and I'll try that. Is that, did that work? Hmm. If not, then I'll try feeding myself something else. But now I said I want the mom to be really caring and I like I don't have, you know, like an immediate hit for a friend. So I'm going to talk to the mom like I would talk to like a super fluffy kitten, you know, and we're going to bring in some mom vibes and we'll see if that works. And maybe that enlivens your system. Like you don't have to explain to people like, yeah, I always use fluffy kittens, you know, when I'm talking to my parents in scenes. You know, uh, the, you can be as creative as you want to be with the things you feed your imagination as long as they work. Yeah, the, and then we're meeting that foundation of you're still talking like a real person. Uh, if we go back to the story worksheet, right, the, the next piece on there is uh, the moment before and moment after. Before, moment after. Uh, and so that is the you know, two, five, uh, 10 seconds before the scene starts and the two, five, 10 seconds after the scene ends. You know? And if you've only if you've only done the surface read or even that just that sort of next level read of here's what the character's feeling, then the risk is, especially with your moment after, and I see this with self tapes all the time, that what happens is the actor like makes the feeling face and then doesn't really know what happens in the story after that. So it just kind of stays with that. It's just like, And that's when you have to go to the self and go like, look, just trim off those last four seconds because like you didn't add anything, you didn't bring anything, you weren't a real person in the place. You just sort of like you knew how the character was feeling, and you just kind of stayed there. You know, the feeling isn't what the character is doing; it's what somebody from outside sees. Right? Uh, feelings are incidental. Feelings are a consequence of relationship, are a consequence of what you're doing. But as an actor, we really need that extra level of sophistication where we're going, okay, good. Feeling is the read from out here. Now I need to know what is the character doing, what's happening around them, you know, what's triggering that. And so moment before, moment after is one of those things uh, that's important to look at. So if you are L, you know, what are you doing before Heather enters? You know, and especially if you want this, a big smile uh, spreads across Elle's face, then doing something that makes you kind of you're miserable, you know, or you know, uh, right, staring out the window at the you know, soccer pitch that you're never gonna get to play on again, uh, like looking at a photo of your friend, you probably don't want to like leaking little tears you know, right at the top of the scene, you know, because uh, then you'll end up carrying that into this initial interaction and we won't necessarily get the warmth or the love you know, that they, the writer clearly wants here, uh, but starting away from the feeling and with a behavioral activity, not just like, no, I'm sad, I'm going to make sad. It's just like, I'm gonna watch those people play soccer and really visualize that. <sighs> and then your mom walks in, it's like, oh, and like in that four seconds of like, I'm watching the thing, you can see my eyes tracking the imaginary thing. You know, there's like complexity to it. I'm not choosing a feeling, instead I'm bringing in the nuance of relationship. You, and the however I react, I side. I don't know. If, often when I do something like that, I'm like, oh, I like I do the sigh, and then I try and repeat it multiple times. And by about the third time, I'm like, ah, oh, my like, oh, shoot, I'm gonna have to lose the sigh because now it's become choreographic. Now it's mechanical, and I can see that I am just doing a sigh to tell people I'm feeling a thing instead of just responding to the feeling. And so maybe I start with the sigh and then by the second or third take, I'm like, I'm just going to have to watch the soccer game and trust that, you know, my relationship with it will come across clearly. And that gives me that five second before. And especially in the context of a self-tape where those first five to 15 seconds are so important in grabbing people's attention, moment before it's just really useful. I spent a whole lesson on it just a little while back. You could find that in the YouTube channel just by typing in moment before, I hope.
if I got the keywords right. Uh, right? Technology is still all me. This is the thing that happens when you take a free class, right? As soon as we can pay somebody else to like tag all this stuff in detail, it'll be easier to search, but it'll cost money. So really, do you want that? No, let's just keep them doing what we're doing. Uh, the, then the moment after, you know, if we're going to go back and look at that script, uh, what's wrong? Nothing. And then it cuts immediately to, you know, sort of where the second uh, piece of audition, these audition sides, uh, would have started. Uh, so there is no moment after written you know, And so what does L do after nothing to, uh, right? If you're L, do you go back to the banana, you know, or, uh, do you, like put the banana down and like get the thing that you want to show your mom, you know, or do you do some kind of small self soothing behavior that you would lift from your own repertoire of so like I end up doing this a lot, but like when I'm in distress. And so like, and so maybe, you know, a Michael Bean thing that's just kind of honest is like, you know, uh, the, uh, the last line, she says, what's wrong? I say nothing. You know, I put the banana down. <laughs> You know, and I give myself one of these and I do my very best to like let my mom, you know, see that, you know, like I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, while my body is going like, shh, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay, right? So I give behavior that tells the story and I'm engaging with the banana, and, you know, with my chest and, you know, like maybe that's as simple as it needs to be for me. You know, like maybe somebody else, you know, um, spends that time fiddling with the banana, you know, and it's the, the like little glance up, you know, like it's fine, you know, and back to the banana. It doesn't really matter what that moment after is, but what I'm suggesting is that you go beyond how is my character feeling to how is that showing up behaviorally, either in the interaction with the other person, what am I trying to do to them, get them to feel, you know, or what am I interacting with here, right? So if, I, if me, Michael Bean, I had that like, uh, yuck, you know, what does it say, pensive, dark, heavy, serious feeling in my body, what am I gonna do about that? Am I gonna try and make myself feel better? Am I just gonna like sit with that twisting, yucky feeling for a second? You know, and if so, what am I gonna do about it? You know, because that's where actors get lost is they're like, okay, I understand the feeling, but now I feel a little self-conscious. I'm just kind of making the face and waiting for the camera to cut. And so it's moment before and uh, moment after, you know, part of, of storytelling. You know, and then I was really interested in this particular question uh, kind of earlier in these lessons. You know, so I think if you went back to some of the story lessons from 2020 and even uh, some of the ones from 2021, uh, you'd see more detail on, on this uh, piece of the question, but is the story from your perspective? Right, so uh, especially in the context of a professional or like a, a professional script you know, where you're receiving the breakdown, like you've got essentially already got the story from the writer's perspective or from the like third person, like way zoomed out perspective. You've got, you know, uh, Elle is a little girl who blah, 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 and her mom is blah, 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 while the world is blah, 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 blah. Or you've got that already. You've got the like way zoomed out perspective. But then in order to find the story that you want to tell, I really think that it can be very, very useful to rewrite that blurb just from the inside from a single character's perspective, right? So if, and all of the rest of the choices you make do change, right? If you're playing L, if you're like, my story is that um, I'm not really as sick as they say I am, you know, and I just want to get out of here. Gives you a totally different story, you know, from, um, the like there's so much that I love about my family and my life and I'm just saying goodbye to all of those things I love right like same script right? um, totally valid choice because it's kind of below the surface wildly different interpretations right one of them you know involves a lot of like I hate being here you know I'm oppressed you're like hooray mom's here maybe she'll be no she's just here to feed me a banana my life sucks you know, the right the other one you know is like oh my god the thing out the window that like fills me with this feeling you know and like my mom oh you know, like one of the things that I love the most you know and like oh like I used to love bananas you know goodbye bananas you know like the, this is the last banana maybe I'm ever going to eat. You know, like, got, I got feels about it, right? Totally different interpretation of it. You know, and, you know, that's, like, fairly extreme, but also, you know, it's a very, 
that's a high stakes scene if you're Ellen, you know, and I think if you're Heather as well, right? So if we were going to do that same thing with Heather, you know, is your story, um, you know, I, I'm uh, heartbroken that my daughter, you know, has terminal cancer and I'm just barely keeping it together for her. Or, you know, is your story, um, you know, I'm like, I'm heartbroken that my daughter has cancer, you know, and I'm just like trying to make it as positive an experience for her as possible, right? Like, and they just take us in different directions. So deciding what the story is from your character's perspective, you know, as long as you're not completely violating anything that the writer has given you, anything that they've given you in the breakdown, I think it's really, really useful in terms of shaping all the rest of the choices that you make. So there's my lesson on story. And I probably said the same things a couple of different times, a couple of different ways. So hopefully that helped it land some. Uh, if you have questions about anything I've said from the chat window you know, or you know, like jump in there right now. I didn't talk about technique, or, uh, but we'll come back to it if we've got self-tapes next week. If you do have self-tapes that you want to submit to us, uh, that is such an easy thing to do. All you have to do is go to the main page, myfreeactingclass.com, scroll down. Hey, there it is. Send your self-tapes. Uh, and there's the email link right there. You click that, it'll take you directly to us. Uh, so my name is Michael Bean. Uh, I have been a professional film and TV acting teacher for the last 20 years. Uh, Officially, uh, the school that I started in Vancouver, BC, Canada, uh, will turn 20 in May of this year. And uh, I'm here every Monday from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. We're on Pacific Daylight time now, which is UTC minus 7. For those of you who are watching this from overseas, you know, we, have, we had Alex join us from uh, the UK a couple of times. It's, uh, it's really fun for me that you know, folks around the world periodically tune into the lessons. Uh, and thank you so much to the four of you for joining me today. Do you have any questions before we wrap up? Because I, I realized this, I did, I'm already in my wrap up and then here, I didn't wait for the answer. Okay. Uh, and if you're like, man, this Michael Bean guy is amazing. You know, like, I wish I could support more of what he's doing so he could continue to teach free classes. I'm so glad you asked. If you wanted to do that, all you would have to do uh, is look at bizstudio.ca, uh, which if you were interested in finding classes for kids and teens, that's where you would find them. That's the school that I started in uh, Vancouver, BC. And uh, if you wanted to find classes with me, I teach uh, adult classes all online, and uh, you would go to uh, michaelbean.ca to find those. Hey, look at that, all those details. And uh, there's Biz Studio, uh, bizstudio.ca for uh, classes for kids and teens. Thanks for joining us today, and I'll be back here next Monday. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.